This past week, I've been trying to figure out what to do for my next video. I've already done like three music things in a row. Recently, I did two covers and an original song, Food for Thought. And then I decided I want to just do another video of me just talking about something I'm passionate about. And I haven't really done anything much like that in the past year or two. I did a, a video back in 2021, almost two years ago, of me talking about movies that I consider masterpieces. The video is a bit fluffy, but it is very much just me talking about stuff that, you know, I'm passionate about off the top of my head. I thought I would do another one of those this time talking about music because, you know, I'm a bit of a music guy and I'm also a bit of a video game guy. Plus, I've been, you know, doing music stuff mostly related to video games, so there's that. Um, not to mention, uh, Hanu the Honda Mackinen did two videos talking about some of his favorite video game composers and they're really good videos and there are plenty of composers that I love that I consider to be some of the greats. And, you know, seeing his videos about that from months ago, I was thinking, how about I do one of my own little takes on game composers? So, I've picked three composers I consider to be three of the best. There are plenty others, but, you know, since I'm going off the top of my head, I thought it'd be easy if I just picked three and I would just, you know, talk about what makes them so great with their talents and their style and th what they've done. First person that I have on my list is David Wise. David was the main sound and music guy for the British game developer Rare uh, from their inception in 1985 all the way until he left the company in 2009 and from 1985 to 1994 he was the only person at the company do handling music and sound. 1994 was when Rare brought on a few other people and that was when they were doing Donkey Kong Country which is of course one of Rare's most well-known works in video games and also the game that pretty much brought them farther acclaim as a video game master house, essentially. With all the stuff they were doing on the NES and other consoles, and of course this when they got Super Nintendo, he was the only guy. And then they got more guys like Evelyn Fisher and Grant Kirkhope. Grant Kirkhope, of course, being pretty much the other most famous composer to work with Rare, though he came on a little later in the mid-90s. David... Uh, his first work at uh, Rare was for the NES game Slalom, released in 1986 or 87. I think uh, the arcade version came out first, and then the NES version came out sometime after. From what I've heard of it, it's definitely pretty limited. You could tell that David was trying to figure out how to work with only four different sound channels. I know the uh, 2A03 in the Famicom slash NES has five channels, but, you know, it was 1986, so not as many, you know, developers were utilizing the DPCM channel. Konami was pretty much like the one who sort of started the trend of using the DPCM with samples stuff, and of course Nintendo would later do it themselves with games like Super Mario Brothers 3. But at that time, in 86, I don't really think any other composers were really doing that, at least not that much. But as time went on, with all the other games that he worked on, things got much better. He was better adapting to the limited sound, the limited yet good sound of the NES. This would ultimately cultivate with the likes of games like probably Rare's most famous NES title, Battletoads. Really good music, like the one song from Battletoads that comes to mind when I think of it is the pause theme, which is the That's all just percussion and percussion samples, which did use the DPCM, but it's such a groovy sounding thing, and David really, you know, had honed his element with the 2A03. Also, I'd like to mention that with Slalom, Ryan Landry, who's a chiptune musician who's been doing chiptune stuff on YouTube for over a decade, uh, he recently put out a uh, cover of the entire soundtrack of Slalom utilizing Konami's VRC6 sound expansion, and it sounds fantastic. It's like what David wanted to accomplish but fully realized with extra channels, plus even sampled uh, the percussion from Battletoads, and it sounds phenomenal. I'll link it in the description. 
description so you can hear it. I think it sounds phenomenal. And it, if David were to live, hear it, if he hasn't already, he'd probably be very happy about it because it, it, it is rocking. It is rocking. Probably my favorite example of David's work on the NES has to be Digger T. Rock, The Legend of the Lost City, released in 1990 in the U.S. and 1991 in Europe. Not only is it called Digger T. Rock, but the music literally has a bit of a rock sound to it, despite, you know, the limitation of having only four channels to work with, David managed to, you know, still create very quick rhythms and really good, you know, harmonies and, you know, try, you know, sneaking in things to sort of create the illusion of there being more channels when there are really obviously only four. And, you know, it sounds really cool if you're playing the game and to a guy like me who's actually, who's worked with the 2AO3, it's really cool seeing how these composers would try to work around only four channels or something times only five, of course. David didn't use the DPCM for Digger T Rock like he did with Battletoads, but he did manage to create a really good sound that, despite it not being as much, it still really worked. Not to mention the game is a lot of fun. I recommend it. In fact, the second stage theme of the game, I was hearing it recently, and I realized that it it sounds a lot like a song that you'd hear in uh, Doom, which is, you know, famous for, you know, having a really edgy, hardcore rock sound to it and hearing that song from Digger T Rock it really could you know fit in a uh, doom like if you remade it using the uh, midi from the original it would fit perfectly with the songs of the original doom it just has that sort of hard rock edge like you know dum da dum dum da dum dum da dum dum da dum you know that sort of thing David did really well with the NES there. But of course, David's biggest claim to fame was his work on the Super Nintendo with Donkey Kong Country uh, 1 and 2. And he did assist Evelyn Fisher with the likes of Donkey Kong Country 3, but it was mostly Evelyn who was, did the music for it. But Rare later remade Donkey Kong Country 1, 2, and 3 on the Game Boy Advance in the mid-2000s, and David got to do brand new music for Donkey Kong Country 3. Those Donkey Kong Country games are his biggest claim to fame and are probably his greatest works as a composer, at least during, you know, the olden days. He's still doing music stuff, of course, today. The cool thing about the Donkey Kong Country songs is that they managed to fill the silence yet not be overbearing. Video Game Donkey did a fantastic video about Donkey Kong Country back in December. Uh, it was part of his Donkey Kong December marathon of videos. With the Donkey Kong Country ones, he mainly focused on the music, and he put it best in that video where he said they were rocking while keeping their eyes on the decibel level, which I think is a pretty smart approach. And ever since I've been working more with Furnace, I've been kind of doing the same thing where I like to give you that full sound, but not like, you know, where it causes peaking and like causing things to like just drown each other out seeing how they did that i think it's a really smart move a lot of the songs in donkey kong country you'll hear where they sort of fill the sound because you know super nintendo you had eight channels of sound to work with each of them capable of stereo sound actually plus you know sound samples and wavetables which is really good by the way. The fact that David and the people he worked with managed to do that with the sound really shows how talented of a sound person that he is. Definitely my favorite of David's compositions has to be uh, probably the most celebrated of his songs, Stickerbush Symphony, which is the song that plays during the Stickerbush levels of Donkey Kong Country 2. That song is really something. It's got a hint of melancholy, it's sort of lo-fi techno sound with the emotion of it, and that melody just really works with, you know, the filling chords as they fill the background and really hit you in the emotion. Honestly, it's kind of funny in a way that such a beautiful thought-provoking song is used for probably the most frustrating levels in the entire game where you're shooting through the barrels and trying not to hit the walls covered in needles and everything. It's like, ah! <laughs> it's quite the uh, paradox, if you will. But with or without that stage, the song is absolutely beautiful. It really feels great. And when I did my first original song, uh, You Make the Change, after I did it, I realized that I might have subconsciously taken inspiration from it. I didn't take inspiration directly from it when I was making it. What I did was, you know, I just played around with chords, and based on what I played, I decided how everything would sound in the song, and it ended up turning into that. But I realized 
sometime after making that song that back in December while I was making my plush Christmas special, I had rediscovered the Sticker Bush Symphony song, which I had heard for the first time, a remix of it from an old uh, sports stacking video I saw plenty of times as a child. I realized that I must have been subconsciously thinking of that style of that song and the way that I did You Make the Change obviously I didn't go for like melancholy but it did have this similar sort of feeling slow crescendo chord thing going on in the background with you know the bass going and it's sort of a makes you think sort of thing I wouldn't be surprised if I was subconsciously thinking of Sticker Bush Symphony when I made You Make the Change but either way it really just goes to show that song is a marvel of composition and music work I cannot deny. David, you're you're a genius, and, and I hope you're happy of what you do, what you've done, and what you continue to do as a musician. And uh, what's really cool is that David was brought on by Retro Studios and Nintendo to help out with the music for Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze on the Wii U, which is the most recent Donkey Kong Country game. I've only heard a little bit of what he's done, but it's not only is the fact that they brought him back on, which is great. It's always great whenever they bring these famed composers back on to do more of the work that they inspired others to do. But from what I've heard, David is still got it. He's working with real instruments rather than with sampled stuff on Super Nintendo. And it really, he really, really still has what it takes to do great music. Not only that, but he was even brought in for Ukulele and Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, which are games created by Platonic, which is essentially a bunch of people who used to work at Rare. They made a new studio and decided to try making the old style Rare games for the modern generation. Ukulele was a tribute to Banjo-Kazooie, which is a 3D platforming game and one of Rare's most beloved titles. And the second game, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, was a 2D platforming game that was essentially a tribute to the Donkey Kong Country games. And well, David was brought in for both Ukulele and Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, and he did some wonderful music work with those games as well, especially Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. I've only heard her a little bit from those games. I haven't played them yet. I do want to play Impossible Lair at some point, but he really still has got it and his stuff still sounds amazing but yeah david wise is remarkable composer and he is one of the all-time greats second up is a composer who made their claim to fame at nintendo now nintendo is of course the big dog of games they've been that way for over 40 years and one of the big reasons for that is the music. There are so many talented people who have worked with Nintendo or at Nintendo. There's so many you could list. But the one I wanted to talk about mainly for this video is Soyo Oka. Soyo Oka joined Nintendo in 1987 and worked with them until 1995 when she left Nintendo and started doing work as a freelance composer. Still doing work to this day, though unfortunately a good majority of the stuff that she's worked on hasn't been fully credited. We don't know exactly all the different games that she's worked on for the music. Some have been confirmed either by companies or by herself on her Twitter account, but so far we've only got like a few post Nintendo credits of hers that we know are confirmed. But besides that, we do know what she's done with Nintendo and she has done some remarkable remarkable stuff. She did the music for Ice Hockey, both on the Famicom Disk System and NES, and you'll be surprised to know that th those two different versions of Nintendo's Ice Hockey actually have different music. Some are shared, of course, but uh, a lot of the tracks are different, but she did the music for both of those versions. She also uh, assisted with the music for Famicom Grand Prix 2 3D Hot Rally, some remarkable stuff. It's got some really good bass stuff. Versus Excite Bike is one of my favorite examples of her stuff. She did the music for that on the disc system. She also did music for Famicom Fairy Tales Yuyuki. Remarkable stuff with that. And of course, on Super Famicom slash Super Nintendo, she did the likes of Pilot Wings, SimCity, Super Mario Kart, Super Mario All-Stars, and lastly, Wario's Woods. Wario's Woods, she also did the Famicom slash NES versions of, and she even did the unreleased NES prototype music for SimCity. That's pretty much all the work that she did at Nintendo. She did a few other titles, though I haven't heard the music from those but I'm sure it's good and she is still doing music stuff to this day. What can be said about Soyo Oka? Like, 
she brought on a really nice big band jazzy style with her music. Like, I remember when I was a kid being a big Excite Bike guy, so when I found out about Versus Excite Bike on the disc system and when it was brought to the Wii U Virtual Console in 2015, I was all over it. I downloaded it, I absolutely loved it, the music dazzled me, and when I heard her music, that was where I was like, wait a minute, this kind of sounds like a Mario Kart song. It was like, sort of that jazzy big band sort of style, was like those chords and everything. I was like, wait, this, this feels like Mario Kart. And later I'd find out that she did Super Mario Kart, and Super Mario Kart is pretty much Soyo's most well-known soundtrack. Like, that jazzy big band style, she brought that to the table with her music, and Super Mario Kart is a great example of that. In fact, despite that being her only Mario Kart game she worked on, it was the first, and it helped pave the way for every other Mario Kart game to come after. My favorite Mario Kart song of all time, and probably my favorite of Soyo's compositions, has to be Rainbow Road from Super Mario Kart. I even did a cover of it with the 2A03 and Namco's 163 on the Famicom back in December to finish off the year with my chiptune music. That power in that song, it just really gears you up, and it really makes for a perfect finale for the game, because Rainbow Road is the last and hardest track in the game, as with all the other Mario Kart games, outside of DLC, of course, and it really shows that she knew what she was doing when bringing out everything for that last rig, flat, gratuitous song. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, sorry, I'm a bit at a loss for words, but hey, you know, that's just how excited I am about her work. It's unfortunate that the majority of her post-Nintendo work is largely, uh, we don't know what exactly it is that she's been doing since Nintendo. I mean, there have been some games that have been confirmed, but outside of that, we don't know what else that she's done, and hopefully someone will be able to dig deeper enough or maybe interview her or ask her or something about that if she has a record of what she's done after, you know, leaving Nintendo in 1995. Because, you know, her stuff is really fantastic. In fact, back in, like, October or November, she released a full-fledged chiptune single called Loop 8A. I actually heard it earlier today for the first time. I just found out about this. It is pretty much like a Famicom-style chiptune song that feels like something she would have made for Yuyuki or for Pilot Wings. She put that out recently and it's pretty good. It's, it's, I'm glad that she's still putting out music and still, you know, bringing that really cool style I feel that really has defined what she's done. I'll link it in the description. It is a good song and, you know, it's cool to see that she's, you know, putting out stuff like that. And I'm definitely excited to hear more of what she puts out in terms of, like, chiptune uh, singles. But yeah, the unsung hero of Nintendo, Soyo Oka. Last up, I've saved a really big one for last. You will most likely know who this guy is. I've covered plenty of his songs. I've talked about this guy. I've sung his praises. He really is one of the big guys, and he's still doing shit. He is a marvel of prowess for game music, both musically and technically. His achievements and contributions cannot be denounced. He is one of the guys, and he is a big inspiration to me and to so many people. Yuzo Koshiro. Yuzo started out working with Nihon Falcom, producing the music for Xanadu Scenario 2 on the PC-88, basically an expansion of the original Xanadu game released back in 1985. Scenario 2 came out a year after, and from then they brought him on to do more music. He uh, assisted with a lot of the stuff that Falcom was doing in 87, and from the onset he really brought his A-game and showed that he really knew his stuff. And after uh, East 2 was released in 1988, he uh, finished working with Falcom and became a freelance composer doing music work for other companies and starting to credit himself in the games, which made him one of the first real personalities when it came to video game music. He did, you know, the likes of the Super Shinobi, aka the Revenge of Shinobi on the Mega Drive. He uh, assisted with the music of Bosconian for the Sharp X68000. Because of his connections with Falcom, he worked with Quintet on their debut title, Act Razor, on the Super Famicom, as well as its sequel, Act Razor 2. He even, uh, with his family, created his own development studio called Ancient back in 1990. And their first project was the uh, Master System version of Sonic the Hedgehog. He rearranged the original music by Masato Nakamura from the Mega Drive for the Master System, rather than trying to copy what the Mega 
Mega Drive did. He reimagined it for the more limited Master System while making it still sound wonderful. And he even did original compositions for it, the likes of Bridge Zone and Jungle Zone, which I've done a cover of. And of course, Ancient would continue doing projects in game development, and Yuzo would continue contributing his talents. Of course, the most well-known works that Yuzo has done music for are the likes of the Streets of Rage trilogy on the Mega Drive. It's probably not my favorite, but it's definitely well-deserving of all the praise it's gotten. He is such a genius with his stuff that he even wrote his own sound driver to make music on his PC-88 computer known as Mucom 88 That is the driver he's used since the late 80s and he continues using it to this day. He still has his old PC-88 setup and he continues doing music with the PC-88 in Mucom 88 because it's just that good and he's just that knowledgeable of the technology and what goes into making FM music as well as other types of chiptune, you know, like with PSG, WSG, and sample stuff, like on Super Nintendo, he wrote his own tools to make the fucking music. That really tells you what he knew as a music man and as a guy on the technical side. And what can be said about the music itself? Yuzo has a really good understanding of not just a particular genre or a particular style. He has done all sorts of styles and has honed pretty much every single one of them. Like, you've got the likes of East, Dragon Slayer 4, and Sorcerium, which has have the energy, but there's also like the slower songs, but it goes definitely for a more classical, contemporary, fantasy style. One of my favorite examples of his is Dragon Slayer 4, the one that goes... <laughs> Like that, the crescendo is like a very powerful, like the, like the sort of the stationary crescendo part. Like that is a very much a orchestral epic thing that he honed simply with three channels of PSG, which definitely speaks to what he could do even with the limited stuff. His main thing was the FM, of course, but he also worked, you know, with PSG on the Master System and on the Famicom and on the Game Gear. But then you've got the more groovier stuff. Then you got the Revenge of Shinobi, like. <laughs> more of a groovy sort of sound. He really honed that like with the percussion, the rhythmic chords and everything. About a year ago, he did a fantastic rendition of the first stage theme from Revenge of Shinobi using actual synths from the 80s, and it sounds remarkable. And then Act Razor, of course, is more of the contemporary stuff, like from East. You have the more intense stuff. But then you've got Birth of the People, which is the song that you'll hear through most of the game. It's the song that plays during the sim sections of the game where, you know, you're watching over the people. It's also a classic style, but it's more of a lighthearted, peppy sort of thing. It's like... It's like, it works so well. That song is the song you'll hear the most in the entire game, but it's probably the best because it's just, he managed to make it catchy enough to work where you can listen to it for like an hour and it won't get annoying. It's just done in a way that makes it work as a simple loop song. And of course, you know, you've got Streets of Rage, where Yuzo brought on the techno rave, badass, beaten up guys, sort of sound like the, you know, the, got the sick, you know, the fucking drums and the bass line and sort of groovy, you know. You're like, you got that, you got that real, got that real essence going, like, you got, 
like that dance rave shit. Like he was listening to it at the time and he brought that with Streets of Rage 1 and 2 and it really accentuated the game and people still rave about it to this day. But yeah, like Yuzo showed what he could do in multiple genres and really, you know, create melodies that would stick in your head and give you sort of an emotional feel. Like he's a, he's a genius, man. He's, he's a honest to God genius. And like with, you know, David Wise and Soyoka to an extent, Yuzo of course is still doing shit he is still making music. He has remixed his stuff for re-releases of games that he's worked on. And of course, Ancient is still developing games. They're actually working on a Mega Drive game. They recently started work on it. In fact, you know, Yuzo uh, has a Twitter, and you can go on there. He posts some really cool stuff of him demonstrating his instruments, remixes of some of his songs, videos of him talking about certain things. And it's really entertaining stuff. And he's a very nice guy to talk to on Twitter. He keeps a connection with his fans on Twitter, and he even has a YouTube channel where he sometimes posts stuff whenever he feels, including that sick Revenge of Shinobi remix that I mentioned. He's done a lot of cool remixes and performances on his YouTube, and it's just some great stuff. Yuzo has even publicly released his Mucom 8 sound driver onto the official Ancient website. You can actually go onto there, and it's a free download. You can get it. He legally made it available to download back in 2018, I believe. It's really cool that he did that, sharing his stuff amongst the people. And outside of the music, I just really gotta give him props for just being a really cool guy and being real friendly with his fans and just bringing us some wonderful stuff and I can't thank him enough for that. He's done great contributions and I'm definitely looking forward to more of what he does with music down the line. So Yuzo, if you're watching this, keep on going my guy. You rock. Alright, well that is it. Those are the three of my favorite composers of all time. There's a lot I could have chosen from, but I wanted to keep things simple. I went with three to make things easy for myself. And as you can clearly tell, I had a lot to say about those three people off the top of my head. I didn't script this. I merely just went off the top. I mean, I had this here on my computer just to remember what they did. But other than that, it's just, you know, going based off of memory and what I know about the music that I've heard from them. I just thought I would talk about this inspired by Hanu's video because, you know, I'm very passionate about video games and video game music. I love talking about, you know, the stuff I'm passionate about, so it's nice whenever I get to make these videos, even if I don't do them often, because I'm always doing other things. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this, and, you know, feel free to talk about in the comments what are some composers that you love, and examples of what they're really good with. You know, you can talk about fame composers, you know, like Koji Kondo, David Wise, Grant Kirkhope, the big guys of music, or you can talk about, you know, not as well talked about composers. Ones that fly under the radar, I'd love to see them. Anyways, be sure to subscribe if you want to see more of what I do, and consider supporting me on Patreon if you want. It's obviously optional, I'm not locking anything behind it, but it would be great if you could support me on there. I do shoutouts for those who support me. Minimum is $5 a month if you'd like to do it. If you want to support me financially, obviously you don't have to, but if you want to, that's how you can do it, it's through my Patreon. I would greatly appreciate it if you were to do so. But as always, thank you everyone for watching this. I'm Andrew Ambrose, and I'll catch you later.